Hey guys, welcome back to another exciting edition of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jones, where today I am thrilled to bring you Melissa Forziat. Melissa is a former gymnast turned marketing and event planner at Melissa Forziat Events and Marketing, uh, where she works to help small business owners and nonprofits to develop impactful events and strategic marketing plans. Uh, Melissa has held roles with the 2006 and 2010 Olympic Winter Games uh, committees. Um, she's worked with 2011 Rugby World Cup and the U.S. Olympic Committee. So, so Melissa is working with big brands to do big things, and she wants to be able to help us authors today to really learn how to play like the big boys, how to market and plan our events um, for ourselves, just like she does for these big companies. So Melissa is also an author herself, and she is the author of several popular guides which you can find on her website. Uh, You'll hear about that later and you'll see that in the show notes. But without further ado, I want to bring you Melissa Forziat. Melissa, how are you today? I'm great. How are you, Chris? I'm doing super. It's been a great Thursday. Uh, I love Thursdays because, I don't know, I feel like Thursdays are my most productive day. And I don't know if it's because Friday is the day after, but... (laughs) (laughs) it's like the anticipation of friday (laughs) yeah i mean not really that it matters anyway because i do work you know over the weekend as well so i mean just (laughs) but i think yeah yeah but i think it's the i think it's the you know the lack of uh of phones ringing and emails pinging that makes the weekend so much easier to work so (laughs) yeah it's like you never know it's a monday but you also never know it's a friday or a weekend or a holiday (laughs) Just sort of all exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, Melissa, I want you to just take a moment, and just expand beyond the bio, because you've done some really impressive things with event planning, with the uh, Winter Olympics and the Rugby World Cup and the U.S. Olympic Committee. Talk about kind of how you got cl- connected into all that. Right. So I was. I started out um, with, as a gymnast. I was a gymnast for eighteen years, and uh, from age four to age twenty-two, and. And that is the type of sport that you spend so much time doing. And by the time you hit your upper teens, uh, when you're a woman, by the time you hit your upper teens, you're pretty much toast. Like you can't really do it anymore. Your body is hurting and you kind of need to start thinking about your exit strategy. And, uh, and yet it's so much a part of your life. It's something that you identify with. So for me, Uh, the way to continue sport without actually doing it was to go into the administrative side of it. And there were a couple of options for that. And it's a bit of a long story, but I I ended up starting to do international sport events, such as Olympic winter games, rugby world cups. I worked with the U S Olympic committee for a couple of years and it was just really an avenue for me to continue the sport that I loved without continuing the sport that I loved. Um, So I started out doing those events and I was getting these skill sets, uh, working with the biggest brands in the world and planning the event management for particular clients, um, you know, making sure that they were taken care of in the context of the overall event. So I got these skill sets in event management, but also in understanding how to frame your brand, how to be a brand ambassador and Um, how to sort of make the most of your message. And I was in that space for quite a few years. And in the last five years, I started my own business where I could teach business owners and people of all walks of life, uh, usually those who don't have a lot of resources to spend, uh, teaching them how to take their brands and their messages and get the most out of it in whatever type of marketing or event that they're doing. Now, that's great that you were able to stay plugged in on a high level. Now you're able to bring that down and give it to the people who are, you know, small business owners. Yeah, I found that in, you know, when you're working with an Olympic Winter Games, for example, it's such a big process and there are thousands of people, tens of thousands of people involved in implementing the event. And you kind of don't really always see the impact that you yourself have on the overall project. But when I work with nonprofits, when I work with business owners, um, you know, micro businesses, writers, small business owners, I can see the impact. And usually you're actually changing a life when you help them get their ideas across the line, because they're able to see a dramatic impact in how they're, how they're reaching their audience or, you know, whether that means they're bringing in more revenue or they're getting more reach. Um, 
it, it changes how they operate and how their business works. Now, you know, our audience is authors and writers, and one of the big things for them is being able to get out and actually build a strategy around their product, which is their book. How does that start for someone who says, okay, I've just finished my book, or I'm in the process of writing this book, which is when you probably should start your marketing. What do I need to do to really jumpstart this thing and get people excited about my book? Yeah, so this is an interesting one for writers and really anybody who's doing creative work, because as a marketer, uh, I believe that having a strategy early on is the best possible thing that you can do. But um, I think that, you know, I think sometimes you can see people who write and they had the marketing in mind before they started and you can kind of see it as it comes across. Um, And there are other people who I think totally give themselves over to the creative process and they think about the marketing later. And I appreciate that there's both of those sides um, uh, of, the, of that coin and that different writers would have a different need. Um, I, for example, do the writing that I do, you know, I do a blog every week uh, and it's a marketing tip and it's something that I am very intentional about. I don't sit down on my computer and think, what would I like to write about today? I think about what people are going to be asking, what they're, what, what kind of knowledge they're going to need. And so I start with marketing as my basis. Um, and I let that guide my writing and my topic. But I think a lot of people probably start the other way and they want to make sure that they have their, they have the ability to be more creative than that. So depending on where you started, when you're finished with your product, if you haven't already, I believe that's a really important time to start thinking about the strategy of where that material goes and who it's meant for. Um, understanding the type of people who would want to read the thing that you wrote is paramount in order to be able to get it into their hands. So if you hadn't thought about it before, then immediately after you really need to be thinking, who is this material going to resonate with and how do I get it in front of them? And that's really what marketing is all about. Right. So let's assume that an author has done the process where they've figured out who I want to target. I know where I want my books to go. I've got everything written. Now I've got to figure out how to launch this thing. From an event and a launch standpoint, what goes into making that successful and just kind of walk back from launch date to conception of the event? So again, it all comes back to target market, right? So when you know what kind of event would resonate with your target market that would enhance their experience with the content that you've created and would help you share that content and that you created and get people excited about it. That's that event is sort of your the linchpin of your plan, but it is not the be all end all of your plan, right? Um, Anytime we do event marketing, it's actually not just one launch, it's a series of launches and a wider campaign. So you know, you kind of use that as one concrete point on on that overall timeline that you're creating and the beginning of your timeline being this moment in time right now while you're thinking of it. Um, and it's important to know that there are many points still to be mapped out on that timeline. There are points in between right now. And when the event happens, there are things that you can do pre-launch, you know, raising awareness and excitement for the event that you're doing, getting people interested in the material, sharing it, and whatever methods allow you to reach your audience um, that will help you display your content to its fullest or tease it to its fullest. But there's also a whole timeline after your launch event. And That's a part that a lot of people tend to forget about because they get tired from running the event itself and they feel like that was the end. But in fact, that's when you've, you know, when you're at the event, that's when you've got your audience's attention and that's when you tell them what they can expect from you next. How else can they consume this material? How can they share this material? Um, What's, what are you going to release next? Maybe you're actually trying to build up interest for that. So I think the first thing to understand is what that overall timeline looks like and understand that the event that you're planning is not the only thing on that, that timeline. You have so many moments in between and after that, that you can face your audience and tell them 
uh, build excitement about what it is that you're doing. I like how you broke that down. Pre-launch strategy, then the actual launch and the after launch or the post-launch comes together. How do you build a strategy that takes you from pre-launch to launch? Yeah. So again, I think this really relates to who is the intended audience of the content that you've created and where are they? Um, so wherever they are, that might be the right thing. You know, it's possible that the group that you're trying to reach, they're already attending events that are intended for that market. And maybe you can be in those places. Uh, maybe you can be a vendor at some of those places and do something that's more in-person networking as points on that timeline. Maybe you want to be online. You, maybe you tease P, uh, content that you're creating through blogs or social media or um, on other people's podcasts like yours or, you know, other places where you can potentially share tiny little bits of the content that will give people an overall flavor of what you're doing. There are so many different ways that you could potentially do it. People, if you have something that is uh, hits a very niche audience, then you know, potentially you can create a branded item around it that would help people connect with what it is that you're doing. So there's so many different possible ways of marketing and there isn't necessarily anyone that's right or wrong. It's just a matter of is your target market on the other side of that? And is it a place where you flourish, where your content flourishes? So there isn't really a one size fits all answer to that. And if there were, it would be saturated with all the other authors. So, you know, what we're looking for is those kind of unusual ways to connect with our audience in places maybe that they weren't expecting to get them excited and interested in the stuff that we're doing. Something you mentioned was just being out and about and being at different things. As an author, how often should you be looking to engage in things to keep furthering your brand? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I think some of that depends on who you are as a person. So now, for example, I'm an introvert. So I could book myself up every day of the week if I wanted to with speaking engagements and networking events, but it would not be good for my soul. So <laughs> for me, you know, that is part of my, uh, my scheduling and my decisions of how I get in front of people. So for me, it's very important to balance in-person opportunities and maybe webinars or podcasts with things that are social media or online based where I can kind of be a little bit more behind the scenes and sort of control my destiny a little bit more. Um, and that's just me, right? So I have to look at my business and think about the ways that not only my brand presents itself well, but that I could continue long term as a human being and still be okay <laughs> with myself. Um, and I think that we all have a little bit of that that we need to account for. Uh, you know, what are you an extrovert or are you an introvert? You know, what are the types of marketing that feed into your personality and that feed into how you can show your best self and your best brand? Um, and display, let your content lead your, the way, right? So um, giving anybody a, a hard and fast rule about what type of marketing they should do is so tricky because we're all different people and we all have different content. So the question is, you know, when you're coming up with your timeline of all of the different types of marketing that you can do before and after any event launch events that you run, the question is, you know, how many things can you put on your calendar that you can sort of keep the stamina up as you go and let that be a guidepost and then be smart about the things that you plan in the middle of that. Well, that's all good advice, too. I mean, I know one of the difficulties with some writers is that they are very introverted. You know, they're, they're very comfortable writing the book and producing the book and publishing the book. But then the sales part, just getting out and marketing is where, where the, the difficulty lies for them. But, you know, you can really lean into that. Um, you know, just because you're an introvert does not mean you can't be a good marketer. In fact, I am going to propose that you're an even better marketer because of it, because you introverts tend to develop really strong relationships, uh, maybe a smaller volume of them. But the, the ones that they build, they build and they go really deep with it. Right. So that's the exact thing that you want to do for your marketing. You want to build really strong relationships. And although you want to get your books out or, you know, your content out to a wide audience, 
you can build strong relationships with people who can refer your content out and help share your content. So if you're smart and strategic about um, where you go to build your connections and lean into the fact that you're probably not going to make as many connections, but go really deep with the ones you do make, you can get a lot more out of that. Um, there's nothing wrong with being an introvert or an extrovert. You just have to appreciate that and work it into your overall strategy. Something you mentioned before was doing podcasts. You talk about doing blogs, social media. Is there any sort of ratio or is it just doing it as it's comfortable for you? What do you think or what do you recommend? Yeah, a question that I get a lot is how often, for example, how often should I post on social media or how often should I do a blog? My answer to that is always uh, however often you can be consistent with it. So once you kind of create the pace that you're going to set, um, you have to be able to maintain that for the long haul. Now, I know that there are a lot of marketing experts out there that have a lot of science behind how often you should do things and exactly what time of day you should do things based on your audience. And that information certainly all exists. But I come from the school of thought myself that uh, we have to live our lives. We have to do our writing. We have to work our businesses. And you can't spend every second of every day marketing right? So sometimes you have to work in the other stuff that your business is actually about. And it's right. not necessarily realistic. You know, I see a lot of, for, for a while, I was seeing a lot of information from marketers about, okay, you have to post eight times a day on Facebook. And then people are sitting there scratching their heads thinking, how many, come, how will I possibly come up with that many posts to do a day? And who even cares? And how am I going to be online all the time doing this? If, it, if you end up becoming a slave to it, it's probably not the not the right strategy, right? So um, it has to be something that you can maintain long term. Now, the flip side of that is that um, I'm a big believer that if you've got more time to spend, spend it engaging, engaging with people in some way, right? So for example, for me on social media, you know, I spend a lot of time on Facebook, but I spend far more time going to other people's pages and engaging with their pages than I do posting on my own, uh, way more time. And I've found that that's allowed me to create great relationships on that platform. And so anytime I do post, all those people are coming to visit me and engage with my posts. So it doesn't matter how many times or what time of day I post, because I know that I always have an audience there because I'm showing love to them, right? And so this is the type of philosophy that you can apply to marketing anything that you've written, because people ultimately want to have these moments with you, this experience with you. They want to understand. People always want more information than what you've given them. They always want to feel like they got the inside scoop in some way. So, you know, anytime you can make them feel like you're giving them that, uh, you're potentially building a really strong relationship. And um, writers have so much content already to leverage that you don't have to reinvent the wheel you can just use little snippets of what you've got over and over again, package it in different ways, and then let people feel like they're part of the process and let people feel like they understand a little bit more about what happened behind the scenes. Oh, no, I like that you said that, letting people feel like they're part of the process. Um, yeah, no, also, and something else you said that was really good was just about engaging with people on Facebook, whether you post or not. Uh, I definitely find that scarcity is a good marketing tactic at times. You... Uh, aren't saying as much, and then you say something meaningful, you get a lot more interaction. Yeah, uh, there's that factor. And then there's also, you know, people have a threshold for how much content they are really wanting to consume and how many distractions they're really looking for from you, right? And so we need to be respectful of that. We need to try to find the upper limit of how often we can be a, have a touch point with them uh, without making them say, okay, this is too much. Right. So it's helpful, you know, if you're doing email marketing and you're, you know, you're you're maybe doing a newsletter or you're doing something that kind of drops into their inbox periodically. What is that threshold of how often they can hear from you where they feel like they got something good from you, but it's not just too much and too overwhelming for them? We're always trying to find that balance. Um, and that's true of any marketing that you do. 
But it's important to think about how do I, once I've shared my message and gotten somebody excited about what I'm doing, how do I kind of keep them in the fold and keep warming them and keep them engaged without uh, turning them away and making them feel like I'm being too overbearing with it? We're always trying to walk that line and find that balance. And we tend to find it while we're doing it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, we're never going to be exactly on the right side of that for every single person. But that's why we plan out the marketing that we do. And it's so, so important for people who are creative to do that because it's not necessarily, um, uh, it's not an easy thing for a lot of creative people to do. And the people who do it well will really hit it out of the park. Oh, yeah. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Um, Facebook events for launching. Have you ever used Facebook events to promote any sort of scaled event that you've been doing? Yeah, um, I, I have. And it's... What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's one of many tools, right? I mean, it's a little tricky if you have a uh, cost of admission because you want to build awareness and make sure people realize that they need to pay to get in. And that sometimes <laughs> right. that message gets lost a little bit. But it can be a really good method for getting people to share your message more easily because it's very simple to take the people who are your best advocates and your best referral sources and ask them to be a little bit more active in inviting the people that they know. Um, so it can create a network that's a little stronger than maybe the standard advertisement might because it kind of gets people to be a little bit more directed in the call to action they make to their own audience. Um, so it can be really good for that purpose. And, you know, with Facebook events, you also have an opportunity to boost those like you might an ad. So there's a couple different ways that you can use it that can really be a benefit to you. But I happen to like the fact that um, people who really care about the work that you're doing can potentially directly invite people to a Facebook event where maybe they couldn't have done that with a standard post. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that aspect too. And I like that, uh, the way that it keeps things updated. So that <clears throat> gives you a chance to stay updated with an event, but then being able to share that with other people, like you were saying before, being able to invite people who you think would be potentially interested in the event and like, and them, like you said, being able to invite their friends to the event. So it kind of has a, a more of a social component to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With book launching, do you recommend using like Facebook, not just an event, but a page for the book itself. I, I would never look at doing any one type of marketing in isolation and have that be the only thing that's happening in your overall plan. Um, and it, I say that especially for social media, because just because you've got a Facebook page, you know, if something happened to Facebook tomorrow, if, if Facebook randomly disappeared tomorrow or it wasn't working on the day that you really needed it, how do you reach your audience? You know, you don't really... Um, have a, you kind of get stats on numbers of people who saw a post, but you really never know if any one specific person saw it. So the thing is, you know, if, if we're on any one social media platform and we're using that to guide our entire strategy, we're really putting ourselves at risk, right? Because if that platform goes away or becomes ineffective on any given day, we no longer have a voice for our audience to hear. So it's all about, you know, with social media, how do you get people to go to other places? How do you get people over to, let's say, a website or over to an email list? Maybe you, you, you know, drop the occasional newsletter or tidbit from your book in their path. Um, what are the options for getting people from whatever platform you're on to the next thing so that they can stay in your audience and hear from you in different ways? Uh, it, it's really important to consider that in the overall strategy so that you have less risk and so that you have a better chance of converting people to buy your book or go to any events that you're planning or, you know, take part in whatever other activities you're planning. Oh yeah. No, I've, I've seen the, the Twitter blackouts. Those happen <laughs> at least, you know, a couple times a year where the, the whole platform just shuts down. Yeah. So, and, and you know what, actually, you know, I have a very strong Facebook community um, on my page. There are a lot of business owners who engage with each other and with me on my Facebook page. And every now and then something will happen, you know, Facebook will change something in the background and there'll be, you know, things will be working a little strangely or not at all on a particular day. And I will get a series of panicked messages 
from people. <laughs> like, I have this thing I'm supposed to be doing. Doesn't Facebook know? What do I do? And they're like sending, you know, angry messages to Facebook customer service and getting no response. And it's like, well, <laughs> hopefully that wasn't your only option, right? And you learn the hard way that you need more than one tool. Um, but it's an important lesson to learn because, you know, any platform could go away. It just could, even if it seems really robust now. I have worked with a number of clients who have, uh, who are business owners who have, are really far along in their businesses. You know, they've been in business for decades, but maybe all the marketing they were doing was on the yellow pages. Uh, I've been getting this a lot recently, actually. And, um, they didn't keep with the times and realize they needed to diversify their marketing. And suddenly the yellow pages is not a thing the way it used to be. And, Ooh. you know, suddenly, even though they've been in business for a long, long time, they're not seeing the influx of new clients that they want to. And they don't know where to go next because they haven't kept their eye on the different tools and where their target market went. Um, so it's always important for us to diversify and be a be aware of all the places where our target market exists and try to reach them in as many of those places as we have the time to do, uh, to, to the time to do well. Uh, and, and it just, it gives you that little extra bit of security you need to know that you're going to be able to keep your audience warm over time until you there, you know, you're ready to do something that requires them to get involved. Yeah, no, it's very true. Yeah, I, uh, it's funny because I, I still get delivered the yellow pages. I have no idea why. I haven't used the <laughs> yellow pages. I haven't used the yellow pages in like 15 years at least. I know it has to be. Maybe more. I don't know. They're doing it just because the advertisers are paying. <laughs> and they need I, yeah, to I, 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 I suppose so. I, I feel horrible. Like, God, I got to recycle this again, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that's what ends up happening with it. I mean, I can't, I literally cannot remember the last time I opened up the Yellow Pages. And there are people who are investing money in me doing that. And, oh, well, <laughs> you know, like they, that's yeah. money that basically went down the drain. So, oh. you know, it's important. Um, it's not the easiest thing when you are in a creative pursuit and you've, you've got content that you believe in, that you feel strongly about and that you created because it was something you were inspired to do. But at some point, you then need to sit down and say, who wants to read this? Where are those people? How do I connect with them? And as many of those things that you can do, do those things, um, and that will be the key to success. What are some great offline marketing things that you can do when you're ready to launch you know, your book? What are some things that you would recommend? That yeah. Um, well, the first, okay, so the first thing that I want to do on this is I actually want to mention that I wrote a, a free ebook called Small Business Marketing on a Budget. And I know that this is a community of writers that we're talking to, but it still completely works for you. The, the oh, ebook absolutely. outlines 10 different types of marketing that you can potentially do for your business. And only the last three of them are online. So um, that leaves seven that you can do for no or low cost. Uh, and usually you have to invest time instead of money for those types of things. But, you know, some of the things that you'll see in that list are number one, like working the refer the connections you already got, you know, who's in your list of friends and family, who are your contacts that you've already got, um, making a list of those people, figuring out how well you know them and coming up with a pitch specifically to them to find a way to get them involved in the things that you're doing and help them uh, help you share your message. Um, another one that I absolutely love that can be really great for writers is partnership marketing, getting, uh, linking up with other creatives, other businesses, and finding new ways to share the content you've got and uh, new ways to leverage each other's audiences. Um, partnership marketing can be an awesome way for businesses and freelancers and writers to uh, exponentially increase their audience without exponentially increasing the budget that they put into reaching the audience. So those are a couple right off the top that I happen to really like. Um, but if you're interested in exploring the gamut, then I definitely recommend, um, you know, on my website, there's a free ebook that you can just download that will 
just give you ideas on some of the options that are available to you. Online marketing is not the only solution. It can be a really good solution, but it is not the only solution that we have. Yeah, no, and it's great to combine the two, just the, the online and the offline, because you definitely extend your reach by far. Mm -hmm. And I find, too, that, you know, online um, is great for getting to a high volume of people in places that you might not have been able to get to yourself. But, you know, I have noticed that I tend to do a lot of speaking engagements and webinars and podcasts, and I do a lot of online marketing. And I always get the best conversions of my own services from speaking engagements because I was there in person talking to people face to face, answering questions. And you really that that quality time that you get really translates. Um, so it's nice to have a comp, you know, complimentary options in your overall strategy, you know, options where you can potentially meet some people in person, options where uh, maybe you can do some things online to keep your audience warm or sort of um, start bringing some new people into the fold. So the, the more of these things that you can do in different categories, the better your overall strategy would be. Now, Melissa, um, so for authors who like to go to conventions and events and places where they can be vendors. Mm -hmm. What are some like what are some absolute musts in terms of like just marketing material that they should have in their booth so that they can extend their reach from that event to to pick up either new people to add to their email list or new readers? What do you recommend? Well, I guess it depends on what the audience is, right? You know, in some cases people will come to these things with one sheets and try to explain what the content is. Um but if you have an option for people to be able to interact with it somehow and to actually give them a taste of what that content is, or even, you know, if you have something that would translate to any good interactive experience, that's another way to do it where, you know, people always like to have things to do and engage with. So um, if the goal is to get end users, you know, end readers excited about your material, then do that in whatever way makes sense to attract their attention, especially if you are, among many other writers trying to get people's attention. Um, and I always like to say that we always need to think about what the next step is whenever we're talking to a person in this moment, right? So what happens next? What do you want them to do next? How, what, what is the next step for them in getting your message? And so when you're in person like that and you're at maybe a convention and you have potential uh, loyal fans that are just meeting you for the first time, could you potentially add them to a newsletter list or something that will let you reach them more consistently once they're not in front of you anymore? So you always want to think about what's the next step and how do I get these people excited to take it and try to get as many of those people involved? Because otherwise you leave, you leave that event and a few people kind of remember you as a cool little anecdote about what they did that day. And then they kind of promptly forget about you. So you don't want to have that, right? You want to take all of these moments that you're investing, all this time and all this money in marketing, and you want to translate it into something bigger um, and always get people moving through that funnel that you're creating. All right. And I'm glad you mentioned funnels um, at this point. Now, for the author who just says, "I'm just this is kind of overwhelming, it's kind of difficult, where do I begin? You have courses on your site, right? Mm -hmm. I do. Well, I have a... Uh, I'm not going to call it courses because I don't want to overwhelm people. I'm going to call it guides and worksheets, right? So, okay. um, well, you know, I've got a ton of material out there on different subjects and it's, you know, usually 15 pages or less. There are a couple exceptions to that, but they're all these like really bite sized, very important marketing topics that if you get any one of them and you work on it, your, your marketing will improve in some way and you will be more effective. So one of them that I created uh, my favorite one actually is the marketing funnel worksheet. And it's my favorite exercise to work with clients on because it's this idea that you're trying to lead every potential customer, every potential audience member down a path. They're, the path starts the moment they first hear about what you're doing and it ends well, maybe it never ends, right? But it ends uh, hopefully with them being your best, most loyal advocate, spending as much money as they can with you and referring you to tons of people. So how do you get people from that first point when they first hear about you, wherever they heard about you, all the way up to that end point? 
And I, what I like to do with um, different businesses and clients that I work with is to actually chart those paths and say, okay, if somebody first heard about you here, what's the next step and the next step and the next step? How do you get them to move up the ladder with you until you've really grown them to their full potential? So it's a very intentional process. And it's something that means every time you're talking to somebody in any forum, you always know where you want them to go next. What's the next call to action? Because you've already planned it out. Um, And you can bring it up organically in conversation But you kind of already know if somebody cares about this, then probably they're also going to care about that. And you just kind of keep leading people down that path. And that's one of the um, exercises, the, you know, worksheets that I've got on my site. And, you know, any amount of time you spend thinking about that kind of thing will benefit your, the business side of the writing that you're doing. Um, Because it means that you are always growing your leads to their fullest potential. Yeah, no, I love that concept of just using funnel. Just it's very important. Yeah, and when we don't know the next thing, we're missing opportunities because there may be people who are really excited about what they just read from us, and they'd be totally into doing a testimonial, but we never asked, and so you can't use that, and that's not content that you have at your fingertips. But it could have been, and you know, so the more thought that you put into it up front to say, how am I going to continue to engage with this particular person? Um, If you can think about that now before that person is in front of you, once they're in front of you, the conversation just flows and you're getting the best possible experience with them. Right, right. Yeah, because I know so often um, when the writers go to conference, you know, go to different conferences or, or events and they've got their, ex, you know, their expo table and they're collecting the email addresses. It's just that the importance of following up. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's something that gets kind of understated because it's like now that you've got this email address, what are you going to do with it? And can you talk about just ways that authors can use these emails to follow up or create sequences to follow up with people so that they have got these fans that stay with them for the long yeah. run? Yeah, well, the first thing that I want to point out is that it often takes more than one time to follow up with somebody to really have their attention. Um, You you know, there's a market, there's a sales rule, actually, it's a principle called the rule of seven. And it's this idea that it takes at least seven touches to convert a lead into a sale and different, you know, different really big companies will actually have this a little bit more scientific based on the testing that they've done for their own company. So they might then say, okay, after we've had 11 touch points with this customer, uh, then we're going to send the salesperson in to close the deal. And the, the, the actual number is not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but it's this principle that it takes more than one time, probably takes more than two, probably takes more than three. And the more touch points you have, the better. Um, So if we apply that principle to any of the marketing that you do for the things that you've written, it's this idea that you have to create avenues to keep having touch points with people and keep having follow up. If you follow up with somebody once and you hear nothing back, that doesn't mean that it's a lost cause. Sometimes it takes time to make it happen. You know, um, there was a client, a nonprofit client that I worked with that I was trying to encourage them to work with me on developing their sponsorships for a big annual annual event that they did. And so this one particular year I went to them and we were having a great conversation and it seemed like they were really interested. And there was like one board member who said no. And the board member said, no, we can do this ourselves. So the client came back to me and they said, you know what, not this year because we're going to do it ourselves. And I knew that that wasn't going to work. Um, but I didn't say that. I just said, good luck. Good luck with it. The next year around the same time, I went back to that client and I said, hey, how'd it go? <laughs> and knowing so well <laughs> that the board, like what right. board is really going to recruit all the sponsors that they need? And as expected, the executive director came back to me and said, you know what? We, uh, we didn't reach those goals. <laughs> they, uh, they didn't really lift a finger. And I said, well, I'm still available if you need the help. And now a whole year had gone by, but now they were ready because they knew they couldn't do it themselves. Right. So sometimes we have to plant the seeds and let like water them a little bit, let them grow (laughs) 
and then we can harvest, right? <laughs> so, I, you know, and that in this case, that meant biding my time. In a lot of cases, it means continuing to have touch points. So to answer your question, <laughs> um, <laughs> what, how can you keep having those touch points? If you have somebody's email address and you have the capacity to start hitting people in volume, create a newsletter, have like a little quote of the week from the book that you wrote, have uh, maybe partner up with another artist and have them create a comic or a, a you know, a, a a graphic depiction of something that you've written every week or every month, just periodically so that there's something keeping people warm. And then whenever you feel like you've made a really good lead, there's nothing stopping you from thanking somebody for showing up somewhere or saying hello or reminding them of a little conversation you had, or, you know, if some news comes up related to something you talked about, you can always do that one-on-one -on -one and have those touch points. But Having something that's like a, an email marketing option for you, such as a newsletter, is a way to sort of keep people warm in volume. And then you can direct them to any things that you're trying to launch, be it on social media or an in-person event or anything like that. So I do tend to recommend that people have a newsletter capability at their access. And it doesn't have to be something that's stressful for you to create um, because you've, especially for writers, you've already got so much content. Um, content is not your issue, right? So you, you can repackage that a million different ways and make it fresh so that it keeps people interested and teased for the things that you're working on. And eventually when you're ready to launch something, they're warm and they're ready for you. Oh no, that's perfect. I, I just you know, I love that when you talked about the rule of seven and just not to give up when people don't open the first or second or third time or, but, or don't interact or don't respond, but just to keep emailing them because I think you're right. It does. It does come back to full circle. The people that are going to buy will eventually buy. Yeah. And you know, I think um, with, w the average person, there's only so many times you can feel like you've been rejected before you just give up. Right. And just because somebody hasn't responded to you in the way that you want them to does not mean you've been rejected. It, it Like we impose our own thoughts about silence uh, that it may or may not be a real thing. Right. So when you're not getting the response that you want to, you have to remember that the person you've, you're trying to reach has so many things going on in their own life and their own day and so many distractions. And you really never know when you're catching people. So, you know, it might be a good time for you, but it might not be a good time for them. And so it's important to just kind of keep these, these sort of non-threatening touch points with them just as a friendly reminder that you exist and you're doing something really great that can make their life a little happier and better. Um, and it's amazing if you stay persistent with that, you may find that a percentage of those people get on board with you. Awesome. No, thanks for so much information today. Now, um, let our audience know how they can reach you, Melissa. Yeah, I've got uh, melissaforziatevents.com which is my website and a great resource if you're needing to do any marketing for the writing that, that you're doing. Um, I've got a tip of the week page on there and I've been doing a tip of the week every week for years. So there's a ton of content in there. Um, and then also uh, I had mentioned that free ebook, the small business marketing on a budget book that outlines 10 different types of low cost or no cost marketing that you can do. That is also available on the website. And then if you just, if you want a community to interact in, uh, I've got a business Facebook page as well. And that's Melissa Forzi at events. So, you know, facebook.com forward slash Melissa Forzi at events. And what's great about that page is I also share marketing advice there, but there's also a community of business owners who are so warm and so helpful and supportive to each other. And if you're trying to get your work out there, you may very well be able to find someone to partner with to connect. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's, it's great to have a forum like this to keep people aware and educated. Hey, author, Chris here. I want to tell you about a program that I'm really excited about called Group Gold. For a long time, I would post on my Facebook fan page only to find crickets. Very few interactions, very few connections. That is before I discovered Facebook groups through the program Group Gold. Facebook Group Gold program 
is the most complete one of its kind to help you grow, engage, and monetize your Facebook group. Mark Mawinney, the program creator, will walk you through every aspect of how to create, manage, and run your Facebook group so that your tribe is coming to you. Makes it easier, doesn't it? When you've got people interacting with you because they want to be there. That's the beauty of Facebook groups over Facebook fan pages. Ever since I started the Facebook Group Gold program, I've been growing my group, building my audience, and I've got people in there who are active and who want to be there, hanging out with me every single day. You can have that too. Just visit my website, www.readyrightlaunch.com, and under the Offer tab, select Group Gold. Then you can see for yourself the magic of Facebook Groups.